Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, would you open in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3? Genesis chapter 3. I love getting sermon ideas from various sources, and this is a, an old sheet sermon done, you can see down here in the bottom, by Brother Steve Hudgens, who died in 2011, if I remember correctly, and his son-in-law now has a web page, and I've got that on one of the charts that you can look up, executableoutlines.com. And uh, he's got all his father-in-law's charts that you can pull down and look at. He's got them in various forms. I pulled this off, and I thought it was a great sermon. And so uh, we're going to follow in the steps of Jesus, but we're also going to notice the things that Brother Hudgens said many, many years ago in an old sheet sermon. And he's talking about five great questions that we find in the Word of God. And so he entitled his sermon, Five great Bible questions, and he begins with Genesis chapter 3. So let's read together in verse number 1. Genesis 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of every fruit or eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die verse 4 the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And verse 8 is where we're going to be talking about the question that is asked when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves or hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now listen to verse 9. The Bible says that the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? So the first question that we're going to deal with where are you? Where are you? But let's continue to read the context. The Bible continues in verse number 10 with Adam responding, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? By the way, uh, Brother Hudgens doesn't use that. But that's a good question too. What have you done? <laughs> the Bible is literally chock full of these great questions. Where are you? <coughs> what have you done? Think about that as we continue. So what is this thou hast done? Verse 13, And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his seal. And unto the woman he said, I will great, greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, 
in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so we want to go back to the question that we mentioned a moment ago where God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you? And so as Brother Hudgens points out in his sermon, he asks the question or he makes the statement, we really need to apply this question to ourselves. We need to look at it and say, well, as Paul said in Romans 15 and verse number 4, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, then we need to look at that question as Paul said and bring it home. What does this mean to me? What do I learn from God questioning Adam? Well, I submit to you that God asked us that very same question today. Where are you? And we can turn to John chapter 3. And we want to notice what we read in John chapter 3. And there's a very interesting statement in John chapter 3 that I want us to consider. And it's found in John 3 and verse number 19. John 3 and verse number 19. This is, of course, Jesus Christ. And He says, and this is the condemnation. John 3 and verse 13. That light is come into the world and men love darkness than, rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so we ask the question this morning, where are you? Are you in the light? Are you in darkness? And we read that Jesus said that the people that love darkness love evil deeds. And that's why they don't want to come to the light. You've heard it said when you turn on the light, all the roaches scurry out of the room. And so what Brother Hudgens is talking about, we see in the world today people that hate the light of the Word of God. And when we turn the light on, they scurry away. They don't want to hear it because they love darkness and they love evil things. And so we ask the question this morning, are you walking in the light? Are you walking in darkness? Are we walking under the control of Satan? Turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And we're going to read from the words of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 26. And we're going to begin in verse number 15. Acts 26 beginning in verse 15. Jesus said, or Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? By the way, another great Bible question. Who are you, Jesus? Who are you, Lord? We need people to understand who Jesus is. But Jesus says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. Watch this, verse 18, to open, now listen, their eyes to turn them from darkness to light. Where are you? Well, I was in darkness. But God sent a man by the name of Paul. And by the way, we understand by implication to all of us, God sent Jesus Christ and Jesus came to open our eyes, to deliver us from darkness, to bring us to the marvelous light. But notice as Jesus continues, and from the power of Satan. There are many people in the world right now, and y'all know this, that are under the power of the devil. They, they are walking in their lives controlled by the prince of darkness, the prince of this world, by Satan himself. And they sometimes totally give themselves over to this thought process. And we realize, brethren, that the world right now is struggling in darkness and we're in a great battle. And brethren, I'm not talking about political battles. 
I'm talking about moral battles. That we right now, as the people of God, need to stand up as we studied in the mark uh, in the uh, Bible class this morning, like Paul in the marketplaces where people are bringing them the light of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because many people in the world right now are walking, what did Jesus say? Under the power of Satan. And we are to turn them unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so are we under the control of Satan? Are we without God and Christ in this world? Turn with me to the book of 2 John. The book of 2 John. And notice how John writes as we look at uh, 2 John and we're going to begin our reading in verse number 9. So 2 John and we're going to begin our reading in verse number 9. 2 John, verse number 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, listen to this, hath not God. Now brethren, let that sink in. If we go beyond the teachings of Jesus Christ, John says we do not have God. Now brethren, that's a pretty clear statement. There's no ambiguity at all in what John is saying. If I go outside the teachings of Christ, I am without God. Notice he goes on to say that he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we want to notice again from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and this time in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, Paul is talking about those that had been Gentiles and he describes them in verse 12, Ephesians 2 and verse number 12 with these words, that they at that time, or that, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. And so we ask the question, where am I? Am I under the power of darkness? Am I under the control of Satan? Am I right now without Christ and God? Jesus would put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. And I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. And I ask you to read with me what Jesus said in this great sermon. Matthew 7 and verse number 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now watch this. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So we have a question. Are we in darkness? Are we under Satan? Are we without God in Christ? Are we walking the easy path, the broad way? Are we, on the other hand, in the light? Look at John chapter 12. And I don't know about y'all. I hope y'all enjoy these chart sermons as much as I do. These, these are a pleasure for me to preach. Uh, Brother Hudgens did a great job in laying this out. In John 12, in verse number 46, Jesus said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So Jesus is pleading with us to come to the light where we find God as we read just a moment ago in 2 John verse number 9. If we abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have both God and the Son. And so are we with God? Are we in Christ? Notice that Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I hope you're turning with me in your Bibles to look at these verses. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, Paul says, he is a new creature. All things are passed away Behold, all things 
are become new. We go back to that Sermon on the Mount. One verse later in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 14, He asked us in verse number 13 to enter in at the straight gate for there is a wide gate. Many people are traveling. But in verse 14, Jesus said, Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So as we look at this great question, where are you, Adam? And we apply it to ourselves. We ask the question, am I in darkness? Am I under the control of Satan? Am I without God in Christ, walking in the broad way? Or am I walking in the light as Jesus is in the light? Am I with God and with Christ, walking that narrow way? And of course, you're the one that can answer that question. I can't answer it. You can only answer it. And so as Brother Hudgens encourages us, apply this to ourselves. Where are we? Second question. This is taken from John chapter 6. John chapter 6. So we want to turn there, read the context, and then we will talk about the question, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? And so you can see it right down here at the bottom of your page executableoutlines.com slash charts and then there's another slash at the end of that that's where you can find uh, he's got nearly 300 of these so they're all you guys that want to teach a Bible class and you want to preach here's you a good resource for you to use in preparing to do that and I know that you guys are wanting to do that so we need to apply ourselves to this so in John chapter 6 the Bible tells us that the people had been following Jesus Christ and uh, Jesus tells them that in order for them to go into heaven, they must eat His flesh and drink His blood. That's verse 53, John 6. In verse 53, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. You can imagine what a shock that was for people to hear that language. They've been following Him. He's been providing physical bread, loaves of bread, fishes for them to eat. And Jesus recognizing that men being what we are, there are a lot of people that will follow whatever it is just to get a meal. And that's what they were doing. And Jesus is upset with them. You need to be deeper than just your next meal. And so if you're thinking about what you're going to eat after this sermon is over, same on you. <laughs> you ought to be thinking about spiritual things right now, right? We ought to be thinking about eating the blood. That's what we did a moment ago. Or drinking the blood, eating the flesh, and the significance of that. And we realize, and this is one of those things that you know, but many people have accused Christians of being cannibals because they, they think that we take that metaphor, and that's what it is, and we take it literally. Now there are some that do. Roman Catholicism does exactly that. The doctrine of transubstantiationism. Say that three times. They believe that when you put that bread in your mouth and you swallow it, it literally turns into the flesh of Jesus Christ. When you drink that fruit of the vine, by the way, they use wine and there's nothing in the Bible. The Bible always talks about the Lord's Supper as fruit of the vine. Never does it describe it as wine. It's always fruit of the vine. They believe when you drink that fruit of the vine that it literally transubstanates and it becomes the blood of Christ. That's false. 
Jesus is talking to a metaphor. He's not saying that that bread literally turns to his flesh and that fruit of the vine literally turns to his blood. He's talking in spiritual terms. By the way, some people are so shallow they can't get beyond the flesh and get to the spirit. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. And so he tells them, I am the living, uh, or verse 57, as the living Father has sent me and I live by, by the way, I want to back up. I got to talk about verse 56 a little bit more. Y'all know I love doing this. It, it talks about when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we dwell in Jesus and He dwells in us. Now let that sink in. We often talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do we talk about the indwelling of Christ? I'm dwelling in Jesus. I'm living in Jesus right now. I've been baptized into Him, Galatians 3 and verse number 27. I am in Christ. Dwelling in Christ. He is dwelling in me. That's a beautiful thought. As the living Father will continue in verse 57, hath sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples, his disciples murmured, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you which believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray Him. Verse 65, Jesus said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto Me except it were given to him by My Father or of My Father. From that time, listen to verse 66, many of His disciples went back and walk no more with him. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? By the way, how many great questions have we already seen in this sermon? <laughs> Listen to what Jesus said. Will you go away? Apply that to yourself. Do you get offended when the truth is taught? And you say, well, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to go somewhere else where they're not so hard known. Do I get offended when I hear the words of Jesus? You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we understand it's metaphorically. His words are spirit, as He said just a moment ago. Spirit, but we need to ask ourselves, are we going to turn away when it time gets hard and when it gets tough? And when the people of the world are attacking us, are we going, that's another sermon. I'm going to have to go on. Notice what happens in verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? That's the question that we're talking about. To whom shall we go, Lord? Let's continue on. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm going to pause there. Jesus asked this question. Or excuse me, Peter asked this question. Lord, to whom shall we go? Well, we know the world. The world has a lot to offer to us, doesn't it? It has good times, fun, and games, and all kinds of activities that we can be involved in. Not saying that every one of those activities are wrong. But we are saying the world has good times to offer to us. And notice that Brother Hudgens puts that in quotes. We understand what he's saying when he says the good times. Because we understand implied in that statement is you wake up with a hangover. You wake up with some disease because of something that you've done. You understand what I'm saying. And so the world, yeah, it's got good times to offer to us. 
Catholicism, well, it offers us the Pope and the authority that comes with Him. And brethren, we understand it is without biblical authority to call any man father, and that's what Pope means. And so Catholicism offers us the Pope. Protestantism offer, offers us doctrines and creeds that come from men. And by the way, you can buy those books online if you don't believe me. You can go online and you can find all kinds of creed books that have been written by men and you can buy, not saying do it <laughs> because it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. As our brethren have argued for years, if it has less than the Bible, we don't need it because it's less than the Bible. If it has more than the Bible, we don't need it because it's more than the Bible. And if it has the Bible, then tear it up and burn it because it's just the Bible or, or to tear it up under the name of creed. <laughs> Understand how I'm saying that. If, if you've got this is our creed, the Bible tells us what we believe. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not saying it very well. Do you understand they have doctrines and creeds? But Jesus, what does He have to offer us? Let's read it again in John chapter 6. And let's notice that Jesus has the words of life. Look at verse 63. It is the Spirit. John 6 and verse 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. Jesus has the words of eternal life. Jesus offers us rest. You know this. Flip over to Matthew chapter 11. Begin with me in verse number 28. Matthew chapter 11. I want to begin in verse number 28. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and follow me, or excuse me, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus offers us rest. Jesus offers us truth. Look at John chapter 14, and you know the verse. Verse number 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now watch this. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 and verse number 6. The world offers good times. False religions offer all kinds of nonsense. But Jesus offers us the word of life. He offers us rest. He offers us the truth. He offers us eternal salvation. Notice that the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll begin our reading in verse number 8. Hebrews 5 and verse number 8, Though He were a son, yet learned He obedience by the things which He suffered, and being made perfect, watch this, verse 9, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. To whom shall we go? I think the choice is pretty clear. I'm going to go to Jesus. What about you? <coughs> Here's a third question. By the way, we're probably just going to cover three. You can read the other two on your own. It's in the bulletin. Uh, and it's also, as I said, available online if you want to research these charts and see these great charts. Lord, to whom? Or excuse me, Lord, what will thou have me to do? The reason we're going to just cover this one because 4 and 5 kind of tie together with verse number 3. And so uh, again, you can look and find this yourself. So notice, Lord, what would you have me to do? Let's turn to the book of Acts, the ninth chapter. Acts chapter 9, we're talking about the conversion of a man by the name of Saul. It says in verse 3, as he, that is Saul, who later on becomes the great apostle Paul, he came near to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any, or I'm sorry, I jumped to verse 2. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, verse 3, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he trembling and astonished said, 
Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now, as we said a moment ago, these questions need to be not just taken in the abstract. They need to be taken personally. And I need to be asking the question, Jesus Christ, what do you want me to do? Lord, what will you have me to do? And I know many of you have asked that question. And you've answered that question because you've obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You've been baptized. But let's continue on and notice what happens with Saul of Tarsus. Who, who art thou, Lord? Verse 5. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You'll see some translations, the goads, that which pokes. And so if you're driving animals, you have a goad and you poke them to get them, prodding them alone. And so uh, Jesus is telling Paul, you're kicking against those goads. And every time you kick against them, it hurts. And so he trembling said, Lord, what will you have me to do? The Lord said to him, we're still in verse 6, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. There's a lot of things in that passage. First off, do not expect Jesus Christ to personally tell you what you need to do to be saved. He's not going to come in a still small voice, whisper in your ears, He's not going to tell you verbally what you need. He's going to speak through His Word. Didn't we read that a moment ago? The words that I spoke, the same are words of eternal life. So don't expect Jesus to be whispering in your ear. He didn't even tell Saul. Saul, here's what you need to do. He told him, you go into the city. And there's going to be a man that is going to answer Notice in verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. We're in Acts 9 and verse 10. And Ananias said to him, or and, uh, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath in a vision, in a seen, and hath seen in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints. Priest, to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. To unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles and kings and of the children of Israel, for I will show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went in, or went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately, the Bible says, uh, scales fell from his eyes. He received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. What did Ananias tell him to do? Well, let's turn over to chapter 22. We're going to hear Paul tell us exactly what Ananias said. Acts 22 Verse number 16, Ananias says to Saul, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Lord, what would you have me to do? Arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. God simply wants us to do His will. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to notice what Jesus, again, the Sermon on the Mount, this time Matthew 7 and verse number 21. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We must do the will of the Father. Jesus, what is the will of the Father? 
We'll turn with me to Mark 16. Jesus came to deliver the will of the Father to mankind. The words that He spoke are the words that the Father gave Him. And the Father told Him to tell us in Mark 16, in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now I want you to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And I want you to listen to what Jesus tells us in verse 15. And I, I reverse those. I know it. I did it on purpose. Different from what Brother Hudgens said, but I was wanting to go a little bit different. And so in John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Turn over one chapter, John 15. In verse 14, ye are my friends. Listen how I know if I'm a friend of Jesus. If you do whatsoever I have commanded you. So the question that we want to focus on right now. Lord, what would you have me to do? I think we've answered that. And I think we've answered it by <laughs> allowing the Bible to speak. Not my opinion. We looked at the Bible. What does the Bible say we should do? The will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you're my friends, you'll do what I command you to do. And Jesus commanded baptism. Brethren, there's, there's no way around that. And if that's not plain enough, Acts 10 and verse 48, Peter, an inspired apostle, told the house of Cornelius, he commanded them to be baptized. Now friends, if you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ, I think this is a pretty clear sermon. And we could go on. And we could look at it in this light. What, are you having, what must I do to be saved? That question is asked in Acts 16, Acts 2, and Acts 22. Lord, what must I do to be saved? And we've answered that question. You need to hear the Word of God. You need to believe that Word. You need to repent of the sin you have in your life. You need to confess that Jesus is the Christ. You need to be baptized. And if you've never done that, I really want you to ask this last question. The Ethiopian eunuch asked it. What doth hinder me to be baptized? We ask the question, what's hindering you this morning? Only you can answer that question. We looked at what, seven, eight, nine great Bible questions. And I want you to answer those. And I want you to answer them truthfully. What's hindering you from obeying the gospel? If there's nothing hindering you, then when we stand and sing this invitation song, we're pleading with you to come. As a child of God, if you need prayers, please come as we stand and as we sing.